You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, podcast.com follow us on twitter periscope and instagram at michigan underscore truth and like and share our verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast also listen to us on spreaker Castbox, iHeartRadio, google podcast apple podcast via itunes and spotify and like staples media on facebook <laughs> The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. And welcome to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. I'm Taylor Phillips along with Ed Smith and Frank Vajner. It's time for our opening statement. It's time to play hockey once again. That's my opening statement. Ed, what's your opening statement? We'll start with you. My opening statement is that the Michigan Wolverines basketball program looks the best it, best it has ever been in a long time. And quite frankly, I think there's still more on the horizon. You're darn right. Frank, opening statement. My opening statement is... The Red Wings are back in action with a new era as Dylan Larkin is the 37th captain in franchise history and also with response to Ed's Michigan Wolverines. This is a team that I will definitely be keeping my eyes on throughout the rest of January and into February and March too because this could be something special going for Jawan Howard in year two. Darn right. And we'll talk about Larkin and those and others. Before we get started, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports app called Big It, which influences more and more people to love sports. Enter the referral code STABLES for Stables Media, capital S and the letter B, lowercase in the middle, when you sign up. Available on the Apple App Store and Google Play, download the Big It app and sign up with the referral code STABLES with a capital S at the beginning and the lowercase letter B in the middle for Stables Media. Now, uh, our top story from earlier, the Michigan Wolverines football team had agreed with head coach Jim Harbaugh on a contract extension through 2025 with a lower buyout but higher incentives. Athletic Director Ward Manuel says Jim is the right man for the job and can bring home division, conference, and national championships. Ward Manuel's out of his mind. Now, we all know they got rid of Don Brown, but Jim Harbaugh is still around. He just signed a contract extension. Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go over to Frank. Ed, they did add one piece. They've hired former running back Mike Hart as running backs coach. That's one piece. Now they just need a new defensive coordinator. Ed, go ahead. First things first, on the contract stuff, I was expecting multiple years, I mean, at least more than three years. I don't think if you're, when you consider the contract that Harbaugh originally signed and you consider that, that he was more than likely going to get an extension, I think the realistic scenario was that this was going to be more than three years. Uh, I think all of us here were expecting five years, so the fact that it's one year less and four tells me something. I don't know if that is your, it, it reminds me, I guess, in the way of South of how some players in the NBA, they have a opt-in or opt-out clause where, you know, I could opt in for one extra year or I can decide to go free agent right now. So that's so seeing that it was an extent of four years kind of reminded me of that scenario, uh, as well as the less money. Is, and Taylor, you mentioned specifically uh, the buyout option is lower as well, meaning that let's say down, you know, if and when slash where Michigan decides, listen, this isn't working out. It's time to part ways earlier than expected. It won't cost them as much money as it would have been beforehand before this extension got completed. And the incentives, I think Ward Emanuel plainly put it out there. You know, it, there was no subtweeting or something that you can read between the lines. He basically said it right there. You got to win your division. We want to win conference titles. And if, you know, we want to win national titles. That was the original expectation and the excitement that had that fans had regarding this hire in the first place. So on one sense, on the one hand, it is refreshing in a way to see that Ward Emanuel has not steered clear of those goals goals despite of how disappointing Harbaugh's tenure has been. Now, for those that may think, okay, well, how are you going to get each done? It's simple. 
If you want to win your division, you got to beat Ohio State. No if ands, or buts about it. Arbaugh has yet to find a way, find out or figure out a way to do it. The closest he's got it was one, you know, was one play in 2016, but that's it. Other than that, domination. So if you figure out a way to beat Ohio State, which frankly, the way they're looking, it's going to take a while, in, in my view. I'm just being straight up honest. It's taking forever now. It's probably going to take a little bit more longer after that. No matter how many players you add or coaches you add, it just Ohio State seems to be just continuously one step ahead. It's infuriating. It's frustrating, but it's reality. But as soon as you can clear that massive hurdle, which is beat Ohio State, because I don't care about the rest of the division. I don't care about the Penn States, the MSUs, the Minnesotas. There's only one team. There's one team that everybody should have their eye on, their, their target on. It's the Buckeyes. You beat them. The division, it's, you know, all bets are off. It's anybody for the taking. They beat Ohio State, win the division. Win the division, gets in the Indy. Get to Indy, win the Big Ten. The Big Ten, go to Rose Bowl. You know, forget about the whole college football playoff national title. There's going to be a scenario in a case where, let's say, Michigan has one loss or even has undefeated season, but let's say they get left out. Well, as much as you want to say it sounds sucky or uh, like a participation trophy, when was the last time that Michigan has been to a Rose Bowl? So, the guidelines... When your vision, when the conference, you go to the Rose Bowl. It's something that was as clear and old school going back to when Bo had it, to Lloyd, Rich Rod, Hoke, and now here with, with, with Harbaugh. It is, you beat the Buckeyes, win the Big Ten, you go to the Rose Bowl. Simple. So winning conference championships will obviously get you in line, put you in a spot to get to the college football playoff and more national championships. But again, with this one simple step process, you, well, this outline, it sounds simple, but it's much more complicated than that. It comes down to finding the right coaches, which, like you said, I love the, the Mike Hart hire because I think while Michigan has some good, talented running backs, they're not quite as feared or as dominant in the running game as they should be, especially a conference such as the Big Ten, where, in my view, need to run the football in order to win in that conference. Frankly, need to win the football, run the football to win anywhere in football, in my view, but definitely in the Big Ten. So having Mike Hart as the running backs coach, I think, is a solid hire. I think between he and Jay Harbaugh, uh, Jay Harbaugh could probably concentrate more on special teams while also focusing on recruiting, which can give you, which can give you those good enough players for Mike Hart to do in the running backs department at least. As for defensive coordinator, that's still a bit of a tricky puzzle because other than sticking a time machine to 2003 and going and rehire Ron English, I don't know what the heck you're going to do in terms of finding, filling that spot. But giving words that, it's it's better than nothing. But uh, the expectations has got to be greater than that moving forward, especially now uh, with this uh, extension that he got. I think it puts more emphasis on those incentives uh, than ever before, though. Pretty simple. Frank, your turn. Follow up. Well, again, this extension was really no surprise to me or anyone. I mean, the four years was probably a little bit. I I was thinking probably either three or five. But I I will say that the university was smart to put a lower buyout in. So that way they can't say, oh, our buyout's too expensive, which... That, that whole line, I thought, was is a dumb excuse anyway if they wouldn't decide to part ways with them, but that's another topic for another time. And, and like Ed said, the expectations haven't changed. You have to beat Ohio State. You have to win your division. You have to get to Indy and win a Big Ten title. I mean, get to the Rose Bowl. Yeah, I get, I get that you'd like to get there, but in this era, I think getting to the college football playoff is more important. And then whatever happens there... You pretty much just got to roll with it because, as we see in these playoffs, that there is only one team that really dominates, and that's Alabama. And it's going to take a long time to get there. And whether or not it's Harbaugh gets Michigan to that level, that remains to be seen. I'm not going to say that he's going to get them there, and I'm not going to say that he's not going to get them there. Based on what he's done in the last few years, I'd probably lean no. But you know what? I think. With the way things have gone, with the way that there's incentives in his deal and the fact that there's a lower buyout total, maybe that possibly lights a fire under him saying, you know what, I got to be better because now they've got reason to get rid of me if I don't perform because... Who knows how next year is going to go for Michigan because they're going to be breaking in a new starting quarterback and plus new defensive coordinator who I've heard... That it's a linebackers coach from the Baltimore Ravens. The name escapes me, but I'm pretty sure that I have a hunch that Jim called up his brother, John, and said, hey, you got a 
assistant coach who would like to be a coordinator in college, send them my way. But that's my thoughts there. And as for offense, this, I think, is going to have to be a put-up or shove here for Josh Gaddis as a play caller. Because he's had two years to show the whole speed and space thing, which... I honestly believe that was more Mike Loxley than Josh Gaddis when both were at Alabama. But we'll see. With new personnel in and also Mike Hart as running backs coach, I mean, I think that's a good hire because, Ed, if I remember correctly, Hart was the last running back from Michigan who was actually drafted into the NFL. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean... That, that may very well, because when you think about the line, the guys that have followed him after that, the Brandon Miners, the Fitz Toussaint's, the Karan Hickton's. I think Karan Hickton went undrafted up as well. So Yes, yeah, he did. It's, it's so, the, so Tucson, I know, really, Tucson's the only one I remember having in the NFL, I think, actually. Sorry, I know he had a I cup of Tucson coffee with the Steelers. To, yeah, he I was, think Tucson, it was either the Steelers or the Seahawks for Fitz. The Steelers. He had a cup of coffee with the Steelers. Mm-hmm. He actually got to he actually got to play like late in the season and in the playoffs one year. I do remember him, but yeah, I think that's that's going to help the running backs. He got somebody who actually made it to the NFL, even though he didn't have that production of a career. He at least got there. Which you said uh, guys like Brandon Miner, Karan Higdon, and I don't know how many others can can't really say that. And I mean, it's going to be interesting, especially with Donovan Edwards coming into the fold, who was the top running back in. Yeah, the country out of West yeah. Bloomfield High School. If that's another good I name, yeah, I th- yeah. But you know, honestly, I think what they're going to have to do with running backs is they got to get somebody who's going to carry the ma- going to be the primary bell cow, carry the mail yep. for them. Because well, this can't, because this whole running back by committee thing, mm-hmm. unless you're going to all of a sudden switch to a full house T offense like high school teams do and have guys share the carries. That don't work in college. You got to have mm-hmm. a main guy and then have a couple guys come in and give the main guy a break every once in a right. while. You, you do in a rotation the way Alabama does, the way Georgia does. Yeah. I mean, we saw, I mean, heck, if we probably saw in the national championship game, Alabama, their main guy, Najee Harris, and there'd be a couple guys to come in, give him a break when needed. So exactly. that's the way, that's the way think, you got to go. And I think with Mike Hart as the, as being hired as the running backs coach, you know, that is the right guy if you want in terms of building up a guy to be your bell cow, to be your, your workhorse, because what was Mike Hart known for? Even though it was the smallest guy on the field, he had the biggest part pardon the pun heart. He would get you those thirty, even forty yards if need be. Of forty carries, I should say. So I think he's gonna try to instill that in some of these running backs. And if, if it happens to be Devontae Edwards, I think that would be the right timing, so to speak, with him coming into the program and Mike Hart as his essential first running backs coach. And it also helps that Mike Hart is Michigan's all-time leading rusher, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, good point. When you think about when you think about the running backs that Michigan's had to even before Mike Hart, with the Chris Perrys, the Anthony Thomases, the uh, Jamie Morrises, you know, that says a lot. And it, yeah, it, does. it still stands even after all this, all these years later. It says a lot too. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So uh, we'll keep our eyes on uh, what Michigan football does next. To college basketball, we go. The Wolverines men's basketball team now up to seventh, and then they uh, just destroyed the Wisconsin Badgers, seventy-seven to fifty-four. Their third largest margin of victory over an AP top ten opponent in school history. It could have been thirty. They outshot the Badgers fifty-one point six percent to thirty point eight percent from the entire floor last night, especially from three-point range. It'll be interesting on March fourth to see when they take on the Iowa Hawkeyes. We'll start with Ed and then Frank again. Michigan is just blowing everyone out of the water thus far. They also have Purdue coming up, and Wisconsin may look for revenge a bit later on in the season, too. Yes, very well. That all could come uh, come back as well to uh, you know to bite Michigan, so to speak. But let's talk about what they have done so far. The fact they are, A, still undefeated. B, they've gone uh, now their second straight game of beating a high-quality Big Ten conference opponent by double digits. You saw what they did to Minnesota in the previous game before. In fact, you've seen what they've done uh, to essentially the, the entire conference this year outside of Penn State. Okay, so that alone says something. I think it, it speaks and goes back to what Juwan Howard was mentioning, whether it be, I think it was in a conversation he had earlier in the day with John Beeline on BTN. How about that? And was discussing a number of things regarding how to deal with the pandemic and all that sort of thing, uh, contact, practicing, and whatnot. And one of the first things that Juwan Howard talked about or made emphasis about was defense. And boy, did you see it in this game. When you talk about going on a 
41 to 6 run to me that's not speaking necessarily as much to your offense that's speaking to your defense and how you effectively shut your opponent down you didn't let him breathe you didn't give him easy looks at the basket you didn't give him open shots you stayed on your man you rotated you switched you did every single possible perfect every position possible you could have done perfectly and it resulted in the run that you had now let's let, let's not kid ourselves michigan can shoot the ball this is a team that can score but their defense is so key and i all i thought it was going to take a hit when Jan, uh when coach yaklich left for texas remember how the praise he was getting for essentially being the defensive coordinator while beeline focused on the offense now he's it's been what a couple years since he's left and the crew the job that Juwan Howard and crew has, has done is frankly outstanding when you consider that, remember they did this for, for the last five games without their primary start, starting center Austin Davis. Uh, that excuse me, allow, of course has allowed Hunter Dickinson to really shine and step out into his own to a point now where Davis is the backup option at center when you believe when you, when you uh, if you think about that, which is saying something. And I think though his coming back into the fray is going to prove essential when you take on teams that can match you, if not best you, in the bigs department, namely Purdue. That yet remains to be seen, frankly, with any of these games, because as we saw, we're going to talk about, or if we can mention briefly, with the MSU Iowa game being postponed, there is that lingering carrot in the back of everyone's mind, like, you know, will this game even be get to be played? So that, uh, you know, we can at least at, for ourselves get the answers to certain questions. But back to the Wolverines and how they were performing. Let's talk about the fact that uh, what they did to a, to a Wisconsin team that hasn't suffered a loss like this in over a, three years, I believe, and the fact that Michigan did this the last time they had a, a win of this magnitude against the Badgers was in the year of our Lord, 1993. And wouldn't you know it, Shawan Howard was on that team, too, of course, as a member of the Fab Five. So uh, it's funny how things in life work out. Time is truly a flat circle. Now, as to regards to what Shawan Howard, the coach, is doing, in my view, if he does not win, and I know this, this may sound slappy, I don't care. If he does not win Coach of the Year this year, the job that he has done, knowing what he was doing last year before the season got shut down, and knowing what he's doing so far in the midst of pandemic, it can be argued for, for any coach. But what John Howard has done, Joan Howard has done specifically, especially taking over for Coach Beeline, and frankly, is outstanding. And to me, deserves numeral, numeral, numerous Coach of the Year awards. And as for the players itself i have mentioned the three-headed monster that is franz wagner uh isaiah livers and hunter dickinson but let's not talk about the other the unsigned guys like mike smith like eli brooks they play their roles they play their parts too okay to essentially make this team uh be the locomotive unit that it has been and when you see of how connected uh, together this team is the point that that they're celebrating even in the middle of a blowout um, Juwan's son, Jace, getting his first career basket lets you know uh, the type of ship uh, that Coach Howard runs and how he has his players all together as one. And to me, that speaks dividends if you want to have a long season because Juwan Howard himself said it. The goal is April. It's not January. It's not February. It's not even March. The goal is April. And he has this team playing with a mindset and uh, in a fashion and manner that, that leads me to believe that, frankly... <laughs> Damn it, they may very well get to another Final Four this year. And I never thought I'd be saying it this quickly post-John Beeline, especially when you consider uh, how the Michigan program has had its ups and downs in the past two decades alone. Mm. Seeing it rise up again this quickly is amazing. Um, and and I told Frank in the pre-show, I've never felt this excited and giddy in terms of following recaps or watching along a Michigan basketball game since the last time they, they had their Final Four run, which was 2018. Uh, and here it is, that excitement is building up back again. And frankly, uh, if this leads to a deep run, which I'm all, all but ready to say, yes, it will, or expecting it to be, not so much where I can't get my hopes up to where I'd be disappointed, but still, uh, this has the makings of a very special season. Yeah, most definitely deservingly so. But you still have to prove it at the end, completely. That's on the team itself. Absolutely. Frank? Absolutely. First, Ed, I will agree with you 110%, if not more, that Jawan Howard should not just be Big Ten Coach of the Year, but I'd say National Coach of the Year, too, for what he's done. And I'll admit, last night's performance against Wisconsin, I mean, a 43-6 to run, you don't see that in a matchup of top 10 teams. You see that when... You have the 2009 North Carolina team 
playing some dumpster fire from some mid-major conference or the 2012 Kentucky team playing a 16 seed in the NCAA tournament. Those are times when you see that. But when you have a top 10 Michigan team and a top 10 Wisconsin team, seeing a run like that is flat out astronomical. And usually I say that when we're talking offense. But you mentioned defense. And me, who has a mentor who is a defensive-minded high school coach, and he lives, eats, and breathes defense, and I've heard him preach it to our players at, whenever I have been around him at practice, it's all the f- same things Michigan does. They cut seams. They contest shots. They check out. They, den- they deny and retreat at a phenomenal level. They switch. They rotate. They do everything asked. And defense is mostly effort. And these guys are doing that. And they deserve every drop of praise for playing that sound of defense. And what do we say about defense? It wins championships. Now, that being said, this is still January. And Juwan Howard said the goal is April. I would say you don't want to, you better hope that this is not Michigan's peak. Because how many times have we seen a Michigan team peak in December, January, early February, and then they just peter out in late February into March. Last year, we kind of saw it last year too. They ended up winning the battle for Atlantis tournament. They had a big non-conference win over Gonzaga, and they were looking real good. And then they ended up finishing the year ninth in the Big Ten. So I would say to all my Michigan brethren, last night you should be very pleased. You should be excited, but don't let this be your peak because like your coach said, the goal is April. You still got a long ways to go in the season, especially in the back half of the Big Ten slate with a game against Iowa and plus a game against Illinois too. I mean, look, I've I've said it here. Hunter Dickinson, he may very well be a candidate for player of the year in the Big Ten. I've been thoroughly impressed by him. 7-1 center, shooting 70% from the floor, and also I love his game. He's not the type of center that's going to camp out behind the three-point line and shoot jumpers like a few others that I've seen that drives me nuts. He's a guy who's going to camp out in the post and eat there like he should. Now, I would love to see how he does against a Luca Garza or a Kofi mm-hmm. Coburn of Illinois or even a Travion Williams or the other seven foot four freak from Purdue whose name escapes me. I will be tuned in to watch that stuff if I'm available to because I think that's going to be entertaining. That said, Juwan Howard has done a phenomenal job in year two. Because I remember people saying that weren't Michigan fans. They said, why are you bringing in a guy who was an assistant in the NBA, didn't primarily coach when Eric Spolstra was away from the team in Miami, and it's basically, they basically compare it to what Memphis did with Penny Hardaway. So you bring in a name who people are just be like, oh, this is a former player, da-da-da, he's just going to make everything funny cute and won't do anything well a lot of people have been proven wrong so i ha- i mean even as a michigan state fan i give Juwan howard all the credit in the world he's not doing all this bringing in a bunch of show and glitz and glamour and nostalgia and all that stuff like another coach at that school oh. who we have talked about before no he says let's get to work we got stuff to we got jobs to do and we're not going to rest until we're done I don't care about, I mean, all that stuff I happened when I was here as a player with Fab Five. That's cool and all, but let's focus on the task at hand. So to that, I'd give him a tip of my cap. That's the key right there. So uh, Michigan is at 23rd ranked Minnesota, the Golden Gopher Saturday on ESPN2 at 2 o'clock. And then home against Maryland Tuesday, it's going to be at 7 o'clock, and it's going to be on FS1. The same night, the Red Wings take on the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets. We'll get to them later on. Michigan State blew a 33-16 to lead last Friday night and lost to the Purdue Boilermakers 55-54. to Anybody remember that lead? I do. And Taylor, if I may, I would like to ask Tom Izzo, what in the hell are you doing playing small ball against Purdue when you don't put anybody out there to body up Travion Williams? It's Tisk. And also, late in the game, free throw situation, what are you doing not having a Marty Sissoko or a Marcus Bingham? in the game to box out Zach Abbey, their big seven foot four freak, 
to check mm. him out on a missed free throw. That's inexcusable and indefensible in my book. Stuff like that, not having personnel in the matchup is inexcusable. That's coaching 101. High school coaches know to do that. Mm-hmm. Middle school coaches know to do that. Right. Youth basketball coaches know to do that. But Tom Islam says, nope. I'm going to play small ball just to see if I can get better. Well, guess what? Second half, you couldn't even throw it in the ocean. And it also doesn't help that Michigan State doesn't even have a true point guard on their roster outside of A.J. Hogard, who I don't even know why he wasn't even in the game late. They decided to let Rocket Watts run point, which he can't do. He's better as a two guard. We've had this conversation before. It's been talked about. But you know what? I'm starting to wonder if this might be the year that not that Michigan State probably doesn't get in the tournament. And you know, if that happens, it happens. Will I not like it? I won't like it at all, but all streaks come to an end sometime or another. And heck, even if they miss, look at the other blue bloods that seemingly make it every year, like a Kentucky or a Duke or even a North Carolina. They're all struggling this year, so who knows? Maybe all four of those make it, don't make it, but we'll see. Michigan State's got a lot of work to do, and right now they're running out of time. I know their game against Iowa has been postponed to when it gets made up i don't know and i guess they're gonna be playing again on sunday at noon on cbs against indiana taylor make sure i have that correct yeah they're home against indiana sunday at noon on cbs and yes their game at iowa thursday at nine on fs1 has been postponed due to uh covid concerns and yes then... because it was a uh, steven steven izzo and uh Marty soka who tested positive for covid correct yep that's true their rebounding and shooting in the second half were both complete garbage in the second half. Too many losses out of bounds on their own end of the court, and they shot less than 20%. But yeah, Tom Izzo uh, made those mistakes, as Frank Badger mentioned. Ed, let's hear from you on this. Yeah, I was completely flabbergasting to see Coach Izzo, of all people, make a mistake of that caliber. Uh, like, Did he not know uh, uh, how well Purdue was doing in that particular area? Did he not know that he's got that Purdue has bigs that can outmatch you and out-hustle you in certain spots, and if you don't have the right personnel, it's a recipe for a disaster. And the fact that he didn't do that was bewildering. And also, it doesn't help that Tavion Edwards also, or Williams, excuse me, uh, had a magnificent showing, and they had no answer for him at all. So that that, that goes to how, uh, that speaks to how we're in certain instances, in the past, an MSU defense could find a way to stymie and stifle a player of that caliber, if not necessarily shut down, but at least slow down his rhythm. I didn't see any of that uh, being showcased at all on that game last week. And frankly, if you're going to show that type of effort or execution with your defense alone, uh, forget about the fact that you blew a 16-point lead. The fact that you didn't execute and hustle properly in the last few seconds of a game like that, where it was still winnable, shows that really uh, there's more problems here that lie underneath I understand what the issues that, that can maybe uh, be seen as per- personally potentially distracting with what your coach is going through as regards to now his son um, and his roommate. I hope they uh, they, they, they get, have a speedy recovery as possible, by the way. But uh, again, you don't want to use that as an excuse. You still got to go out there, still got to play the games, you still got to coach, you still got to go out there and execute. And they've not been doing that, and thus they've been paying the price. Now, do I think they're in danger of missing out on the tournament? I think that still remains to be seen. Because like Frank was talking about early with Michigan, there's still a whole lot of season left. And they could turn it around in a flip of a dime. You know Izzo, how Izzo like I, I hate to sound like the meme itself, but you know how Izzo likes to turn it on late in the year before we get to March. So there have been years before in the past where they look, they look real slow and creaky out the gate, even in, uh, in a few games into the conference season. And then they still turn around and have a good showing if not outright win the conference title so do i think they're going to win the title uh in the big 10 no especially with the way how michigan and iowa has been performing at the very least but uh, can they still write the ship in a way to where i expect them to at least make the tournament yes it's more than likely now there is a given chance that they can just bottom out um down the stretch and then not make it all that'll be saying something but I, unless i see it for myself happen that very rarely does Izzo allow that to happen because it shows that his players have absolutely quit on what's left on the season and very rarely have I ever seen that of an Izzo-led team probably one time in the past 10 or so years 
that lets you know if there's a track record, how he maintains his players, uh, and he expects them to be at a certain level, and frankly, speaks to the caliber of the program. So, now, again, this could be another down year, one of those rare once in a blue moon type of things, but again, that still remains yet to be seen. Yep. So, uh, we've already mentioned the schedule. Uh, we went over it. So, uh, Pistons, uh, they lost to the Milwaukee Bucks 130-115 to 115 in Milwaukee last Wednesday. We gave you live coverage on that. They beat the uh, Phoenix Suns last Friday night, 110-105 to 105 at home. And then they uh, lost to the Utah Jazz, 96-86 to 86 at home. And now they're home tonight against the Bucks, and they lose 110-101. to 101. Bucks were uh, favored by 10 points. Pistons only lost by 9. So um, the Pistons, uh, this is not the first time they uh, gave the Bucks of Milwaukee a fight. So, uh, Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go over to Frank. Uh, they got the Wizards. Uh, check that. They got their game against the Wizards postponed as well, along with the uh, Suns and Warriors. But the Pistons are at the Miami Heat Saturday at 8 and Monday at 3, and then they're at the Atlanta Hawks Wednesday at 7.30. Ed, uh, the tank continues to roll along. Yes, it does. Um, I do like what I see out of players like Sadiq Bey. Uh, Sadiq Bey. I liked what I was seeing of Killian Hayes before he got hurt. So at least there's some bright spots to look into that regard. Good to know that Blake Griffin and Derrick Rose's bodies have held up well so far. You don't know how long that's going to last. And uh, other than seeing what I want to see out of Sekou Dumboya amongst other players for other for note improvement, still very iffy. I'm more dampered with my um, excitement for Dwayne Casey, I can admit, now than I was originally at the higher. Still think he's a good coach, but uh, it's, it's I haven't gotten the general oomph that I know he's going to be here for the long run. So that may hamper the expectation of how either this tank progresses or regresses given how, how things may go um, down the road. But it is to note that they are competitive at the very least. If they were just making just stinking up the joint night in and night out, you would say, man, this is a blatant and obvious tank, more so than the record would indicate. But the fact that they are competitive and you know that, frankly, they just don't have the, the caliber of talent to compete with some of the better teams in the league speaks for itself. You know you're in a weaker conference, so that alone makes things look bad on the surface. But again, knowing the team that, that, that they have been for quite some time and the fact that they're trying to work through these bad contracts to set themselves up for a better spot and the young core that they have right now, it's not surprising that they're at this at this type of record right now early on. I do hope at the very least for their sake in terms of building up confidence, they do get some more wins uh, throughout the course of the season. But uh, yeah, you know, I'm not pressed or worried about how this team may go or what, what they can or can't do because I wasn't expecting a playoff run anyway this year. So that thought has not changed. And uh, we'll just, it is all about seeing the development at this point and hope no one um, suffers another injury the way we saw with Killian Hayes. Right, exactly. Frank, follow up. Yeah, I mean, the Pistons pretty much are what they are. They're a team that's trying to rebuild. They're trying to get young guys developed. And, you know, you just got to hope that, like Ed said, you don't have any more injuries like what Killian Hayes had. I mean, look, this team's, like we said, this isn't a team that's going to compete for a playoff spot this year. Probably not next year either, but it just it just is what it is at this point. They're just trying to get things going in the right direction. But that's a process, and they're not doing like the Philadelphia 76ers. This is a team that's at least competitive, but they're just not good enough to beat the big guns in the NBA. Simple as that. Right, exactly. Pistons, um, I just went over the schedule. They got their uh, game against the Wizards postponed. They got the uh, road doubleheader against the Heat, and then they're at the Hawks uh, in Atlanta at State Farm Arena next Wednesday at 7.30. We'll uh, give you at least a couple live updates on that game next week. So, uh, transitioning to the Detroit Lions, they interviewed New Orleans Saints executive Jeff Ireland and Indianapolis Colts assistant general manager Ed Dodds for their general manager position. They showed interest in Tampa Bay Buccaneers defensive coordinator Todd Bowles for the head coach position. They interviewed New Orleans Saints assistant coach Dan Campbell for the same thing, the head coach position. And then they did a second interview with Brad Holmes. So this may uh, be one of the five questions coming up, but uh, Brad Holmes seems to be the favorite. We'll start with Ed and then Frank. Ed, go ahead. Uh, yes, Brad Holmes, we usually when you see uh, a second interview uh, being brought in play, uh, um, that is the case, uh, especially in regards to Brad Holmes. 
he was, of course, the Ram, or he has been the Rams director of college scouting. And that's essentially as akin to close to a general manager spot as you're going to get because what you're figuring out the uh, the next breed of talents that's coming into the league and who you know who you could recommend for the team to draft. So that's as close to a, as a general manager spot as you're going to get. And you've seen what the Rams have done over the past few years. They've built themselves up into a, a NFC perennial contender. And the fact that they're still in the playoffs right now as we speak. So not too far removed from a Super Bowl run a couple of years back. That, to me, speaks to uh, how how much the Lions are considering them. There's also another um, possibility that they may look in the other direction. For example, they could be George Patton, you know, the, G- the, the assistant GM for the Vikings. He could be another possibility. Not to mention the fact that he has close ties with Chris Spielman. Uh, the fact that um, Spielman's brother, Rick, is the GM of the Vikings. That could hey, be Ed, a possibility. I don't, Ed, I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, George Payton just took the uh, Broncos GM job today. Mm-hmm. He just took it today. Well, again, that crosses one name off the list. So there's one aspect. But I- I'll say this. Another name that has been catching my eye as of late, frankly, that could be catching up some fire, is Kevin Colbert of the Steelers. Dave Perquet sent out a tweet earlier this morning saying that, quote, one more thing on the Lions GM front, just my opinion, but I would not rule out Kevin Colbert yet. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen soon or not at all. When you consider also the fact that Mike Stone, Stoney of 97.1, just recently said this morning himself that it's more than that, it may very well be an offer on the table. Quoting Stoney, as quoted on Pride of Detroit, quote, I just got off the phone with a trusted source who has told me that the Lions have made an offer to Kevin Colbert, and it's pretty close to happening. We'll just go with that. I'm not going to say it's done or anything like that. Someone I know pretty well, someone connected, said that they've offered the job to Kevin Colbert, and unless the Ro- unless with the Roonies come up with some kind of crazy counter over, uh, counteroffer, he might be coming back. The fact, and when he says coming back, Kevin Colbert has a previous history with the Lions because you know, in terms of college director, we just mentioned college director with uh, Brad Roberts, or from 1990 to 99, Kevin Colbert was the team's pro scouting director. So that could be a possibility of what Stoney was talking about. Now, granted, though, that may have been conflicted because Jerry Dulock, he had a tweet of his own that contradicted what Stoney was saying, that the Steelers have not received the request. So it depends on what side you believe. Uh, in fact, Tony, in fact, Stoney himself went out to said, obviously, my information has been debunked. This does not mean there isn't or wasn't back channel things going on. This is a reputable football person, not a limo driver, lawyer or chef. It appears he is wrong. And as on me. So we'll see if Stoney is, in fact, wrong or if it's just a cover to what's really lying underneath. But I would say keep an eye out on that, especially knowing that the Steelers are out of the playoffs now. And consider the fact that Ben Roethlisberger, who knows what Big Ben's future may be. Kevin Colbert may need a fresh start somewhere. To me, when you consider the fact that if you connect some of the dots, the Lions could be could be a possible destination. So when you consider the fact that, yes, before Tony's quote-unquote scoop or exclusive got debunked, let's not forget about the Dave Perquet tweet. I think that bears more weight than, than people understand. But again, we'll, we just have to see where that goes from there. But to me, I wouldn't quite necessarily start hedging my bets on Brad Roberts just yet. Or Brad Holmes? Brad Holmes, excuse me, sorry. Yeah, Frank, what do you think of those names? I mean, the Kevin Colbert stuff, I think you just have to take for what it's worth. And look, the whole f- uh, thing about the Lions have offered him Technically, they can't because he's under contract with the Steelers through the draft and offering him anything would be considered tampering. And as for the Brad Holmes stuff, him getting a second interview, I mean, I think he would be a good candidate. I mean, he's been helping find guys not just in the first round since the Rams haven't had a first round pick in the last couple of drafts, but they find guys in the second, third, fourth rounds. And a few names. Cooper Cup, who was a third-round pick. He's one of the best receivers in the NFL. And there's there's others as well. Josh Reynolds, Tyler Higby, and there's even guys in their defense who he's helped find as well. I mean, really the only, I would say the only bad pick that he may have anything to do with, I'm not saying he does, was probably the pick of Greg Robinson in the 2014 draft, second overall, but that was also the same draft they got Aaron Donald in. So, again... I think it would be a good move to bring him in. Ed Dodds, I mean, he was in the room for Seattle when it was key in getting a lot of the members of the Legion of Boom. And also, he's done really nice work as the number two man in Indy to Chris Ballard. So I'd say either of those candidates mm-hmm. would be a great move. We'll see what they go with. I'd be, I would be happy with either one of those guys. 
And also, think about this for a theory. What if, you know, this isn't some type of long-term goal uh, for this particular hire? What if this is setting up someone down the road to take the reins? Maybe someone from within. Maybe someone from the advisor group. I'll just throw it out there. What if down the road we could see Chris Spielman become the general manager of the Detroit Lions? Not this year, not next year, but say three or four years from now. Is that a possibility? Hmm. We don't know. Frank? Uh... I, it'll be interesting to see if that does happen down the road. But again, I think it's still way too early to tell for sure. But, you know, who knows what Chris Spielman will do once they have a DM and head coach in place. If he sticks around on running football operations, which I hope he does because he's a football guy. And if it leads to him getting a higher position, we'll see. But that's something that I think is way too early to tell at this point in time. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. So that's Lions. Now the Red Wings. Uh, It's time to drop the puck tomorrow. The Red Wings earlier have claimed defenseman Kristen DeJuice off waivers, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, from the Anaheim Ducks. And we usually... It's Christian Juice. 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 Yep. Orange juice. Juice. Gotcha. So, um, Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go on to Frank. Ed, what's your grade on Christian Juice, defenseman? I think my my grade on him could be a C+, almost a B-. minus. He does have um, some talent in him. He is the son of a former defenseman himself uh, in, in Pierre Jus. He's played, he's, he's been a regular in Sweden for quite some time. He did win a cup with the, with the Capitals in 2018. So he does bring that type of experience for the younger players to learn from. So there's also that as well. And I think, again, it, it helps you give defensemen help. It gives you help on the blue line. Like, frank, frankly, that's what this team has been lacking for quite some time. So I, I, like, I like the fact that Eisman is paying more attention to it this year than he had last year. So that C minus, C plus, but almost borderline B minus. All right. Frank, what's your grade on Christian Juice? For now, I'm going to give it a C plus, but it does have room to improve. If Juice gets any playing time immediately or down the line, it sounds like he's going to be on the taxi squad for now. We'll see. But, I mean, he did end up being a part of the Capitals winning a cup and his old and his father, Par Juice, actually had a stint with the Red Wings, mind you, back in the 90s. So I guess maybe Steve having to play with, ended up playing with his dad. So maybe there's that connection there. So And plus he had some depth to the blue line, which is something that the Red Wings need. And I think he can end up playing over a guy like uh, Gustav Lindstrom or somebody like that. We'll see what he does. I'm giving it a C plus, but I'm going to allow it set room to improve down the line which i think it can yeah i have to agree with that one i'm gonna go with a c plus for now but uh we'll see how christian juice can develop in the future so uh other uh, red wing stories to uh get out of the way they have placed evgeny svechnikov on waivers so uh ed we'll start with you and then we'll go to frank it, it seems uh evgeny svechnikov from what i've heard probably uh didn't perform up to uh expectations probably in training camp i think that could be that could be contributed to the injuries that he's suffered the past couple years whether it be to his knee or to his arm but but granted there were some expectations when he was originally drafted especially when you consider his role was possibly be a a grinder on the fourth line that type of feel he did score 20 years 20 goals in, in one of his years down in grand rapids so there was some promise there but again the injuries that popped up um, that played a role as well, but he still may be a factor for him because I believe, as of yesterday, it was reported by Helen St. James in, in the Free Press that uh, Shvetsnikov went unclaimed after being put on a waiver on a waiver. So he can either, you know, that can give the Wings the option of either keeping him on the roster, assign him to the taxi squad, or just send him back down to Grand Rapids. So at the very least, no matter what, he still has a job with the team. But it goes without saying that, you know. Some things haven't quite worked out, but and they almost risked losing him for nothing, <laughs> essentially. But um, and even hell, Blash, Blash himself said it. Uh, Evgeny, I'm just quoting him for what he said on Monday at a press conference. He said Evgeny's had a number of injuries, so he hasn't been able to show a full kind of season of where he's at. But we also have to make roster decisions, and you're restricted to your roster. Nothing is permanent. You have to risk. You have to take that risk potentially of losing guys. But let's see where we're at at noon tomorrow. And as we saw, he went unclaimed. He's, as of now, still with the team. You hope for his sake that he is healthy enough to show uh, what he's capable of. But again, that's just yet to be seen. Yeah, and Jeff Blashell may have a point on Evgeny Sveshnikov not staying healthy, not being able to stay healthy. Frank, any thoughts on that? 
as much as I have definitely kind of leaned towards the fact that Evgeny Svechnikov has been a bust, given the fact that he was a first-round draft pick and has far fallen below expectations, I do understand that it's not entirely his fault that he got injured. And I think that's definitely played a role in him not performing well. So... Again, him going unclaimed, I guess that at least allows him to at least finish out his time in Detroit because I believe he's on the final year of his current deal. Owen will be a restricted free agent in the next offseason. So we'll see if he ends up on the tax. I believe he is being sent down to Grand Rapids. I don't believe he is on the taxi squad. But wherever he's at, I'm sure he'll get some time to play and just prove, say, hey, you know what, I can still play. And whether or not Steve Eisman decides to bring him back is entirely up to him and frankly it shows um how lenient they have been giving them this much of a chance because i doubt any other gm would be as patient with, with Shreshnikov as the red wings have been either with holland or now with eisenman yeah good points and uh, we'll get the official word on evgeny Sveshnikov, whether he's uh, claimed off waivers or sent down to grand rapids or whatever so the Red Wings, they've named center Dylan Larkin as their new captain. We've all expected that. I'm okay with him being captain, but he's got to learn how to control his temper on the ice. He's been lucky not to be called for any unsportsmanlike conduct penalties at all in his NHL career. Granted, he's a great player. He can score goals, but he's got to harness his frustration. He's got to harness his passion. Ed, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Frank. Ed, go ahead. I see what you're saying, what you're saying, what you're talking about, Tara, but I think the Red Wings, they like that in a way because it shows – his intensity it shows his care it shows his care for the game and it shows that he's willing to put in the effort he's not going to half-ass it out there but you're right he does need the right amount of discipline to make sure it doesn't go off the rails but what he brings to the table not just in goal scoring uh not just in athletic ability not just in youth and potential but the fact that he's been involved with this community because remember other teams other franchises in the NHL or any other sport in general, but especially in the NHL, some teams may treat uh, the captain spot a certain way or they may view it in a certain spot or a certain hierarchy. But in certain cities, that C means something. In Detroit especially, that C definitely means something when you consider the legacy, the lineage, the lore, the history that that position has entailed for this franchise alone. How? Eiserman, Lidstrom, Zetterberg, all those guys I just mentioned, either Hall of Famers or surefire Hall of Famers, if not first ballot Hall of Famers. That is the expectation that, or the pressure in a sense that has been put on you, the expectations of what you have to follow to uphold a standard, essentially a gold standard that you have to live up to. I get it. It can be daunting. But I think Dylan Larkin has that attitude, has that intensity that you mentioned, Taylor, to where he wants to take this on as a challenge and i think that's something that you want to see in a captain especially for a team in a city such as this a team that has gone through the times they've been through it says something and when and and, and it's up note though of uh, the entire history of the team this is the first native-born michigander to be named as captain of the detroit red wings so think about that he's essentially this 24 year old young man is living what Every young boy, either in the 80s or the 90s in the, or in the early 2000s, grown up, that watched this team, that lived and died with them through the heartbreaks, through the triumphs, through the Stanley Cups, through the eliminations, all of that. At least one of, those, one of those kids watching this team had a goal or a dream in their mind that, hey, one day I want to be the captain of the Detroit Red Wings. I want to, I, you know, Steve Eisman, he inspired me. Nick Litz, he inspired me. Hank Zetterberg, he inspired me. Apparently that inspired Dylan Larkin enough to where he worked his tail off, he put in the effort. And he not just contributed, but he led by example for his team and in the community and in the city as well and around the league as well. He showed that, listen, uh, despite some of the faults I may have, I have what it takes. I am. There's no one better that can handle this spot than me. So I think they recognized it. They looked at it. They waited it. They waited it out. But again, I think it was all but a, but a given. But they just wanted to see how it would look, especially in this first year of I, uh, under Eisman's tenure. Eisman was not going to give that out quite so handedly he wanted to see what Dylan was going to do I think he was impressed enough to say okay now's the time now it's your turn kid so now here he is 24 years of age this mantle being bestowed upon him I want to see how it's going to do for his game how it's going to motivate him because I think it's a big deal when you're named 
the captain of the Detroit Red Wings. That is that al- al- alone lets you know, hey, this guy means business. Hey, they believe or see something in this guy that they want to put him in that spot, and that's going to draw attention, whether it be good or bad. It's going to draw that attention. So uh, my my best hope and best bet to Dylan is I hope he's prepared for it. Yep, Dylan Larkin has shown the same passion as Steve Eisenman used to do when he played for the Red Wings on the ice. Frank, your turn. Follow up. I have been banging this drum ever since the day Dylan Larkin made his NHL debut, that he should be the next captain whenever Zetterberg decided to step down. And I continued to beat said drum when Zetterberg could not play anymore because of his back problems. And he sh- I said, Larkin needs the C. I believe he is the face of the franchise. He was born and raised in the Detroit area, played his college hockey at the University of Michigan. This guy is everything you look for in a captain. Now, look, I know in his younger days he had some growing up to do, but I think he's learned from times like that. He's been an all-star. He's scored big goals in regular season games. Had four overtime winners last season, guys. That's something you, those are things you look for in the face of your franchise. A guy who's going to score big goals. Granted, he's not had a chance to do it come playoff time. But I believe those days will come eventually. And I believe he's the guy to be the leader of the team, be the face, be the elder statesman. Now that he's a little older and wiser, this is a well-deserved honor for him. So Larkin, the 37th captain in franchise history, his name will eventually go in the same lineage as Iserman, as Nick Lidstrom, as Henrik Zetterberg, as... Alex Del Vecchio as Sid Abel and many other Red Wings captain who has done great things. Larkin will be next, and you can take that to the bank. All right, and he'll be uh, working with some of those uh, veteran players like Vlad Nemestikov, Bobby Ryan, even players like Troy Stetcher, John Merrill, Fabry. and Robbie Fabry, and Thomas Grice, the new number one goaltender. But in other Question. words... Question, I'm sorry, pardon the interruption. Correct me wrong. Did they bring back um, Philpola or no? Yes. Philpola is in the final year of his current deal. All right, cool. I don't hear. So all that being said, all eyes will be on Dylan Larkin when he plays on the ice every single game. So that being said, their upcoming schedule looks like this, uh, just the first four games. They're home against the Carolina Hurricanes Thursday at 7.30 and Saturday at 7 at Little Caesars Arena. Then they play at Little Caesar Arena again against the Columbus Blue Jackets Monday at noon and Tuesday at 7.30. They're playing all games only against their Discover Central Division opponents. They're off after those games until like later in the week against the Chicago Blackhawks United mm. Center. Oh, yeah. Those matchups will be interesting to see. They're going to play the Dallas Stars, the Tampa Bay Lightning, and the Florida Panthers, and so on and so forth. But it's a 56-game season as we all know it today. After the regular season comes the playoffs. If the Red Wings do make it, they'll have a chance to play other teams from other divisions. If not, other teams will do the same. So the Tigers uh, have signed right-handed starting pitcher Michael Fulmer to a one-year $3.1 million deal to avoid arbitration. That came out of nowhere. And then MLB was planning a 162-game season with spring training. Guys, any thoughts on Fulmer? and uh, the MLB season. On former, I just hope he's doing better in his recovery. I know he had Tommy John in 2019, and he tossed only like a handful of innings last season, then missed all uh, of 2020, Uh, and that was that. I have noticed, though, you know, through his struggles with his injuries and his rehabilitation, he's lost some weight. You know, I remember, you know, a few years back, he had more weight on him then than he does now. That could help in terms of his stamina, keeping him in games longer. Uh, and, and that and that uh, aptitude, but the main priority is his arm, his elbow, and other injuries that may beleaguer him. Because remember, this kid was was a rookie of the year just a few years back. He was seen as one of those potential aces that could take the mantle mantle from guys, you know, from Verlander whenever they moved on from him. Now he's almost seen as an afterthought, and and that's very disappointing, but um, I'm not quite ready to give up yet on Michael Homer, even though some signs may be pointing to I really should. Me neither. So, uh, Frank, 
Any thoughts on Fulmer and the MLB season? As much as I have been in the camp that the Tigers should have traded Fulmer when they had the chance to help accelerate their rebuild, I do sincerely hope that he can get back to being the dominant pitcher that he was in his rookie year, and that he has recovered from Tommy John after missing all last season. Plus, this was a one-year deal, so it's quite possible that if he does pitch well in the first part of the season, he could end up becoming that rental player that a contending team is looking for maybe that extra arm to add so i do hope that he does perform and play well also maybe he he can still get a decent return if you do decide to trade him yep and michael fulmer will be uh, working under manager aj hinch he'll also be working with new players such as outfielder robbie grossman which they've signed to a two-year ten million dollar deal a week or two ago so it's time for the five question segment and we'll have a bonus question right after that Question number one, who should the Michigan Wolverines football team bring in as their defensive coordinator? Ed, we'll start with you. Well, I said it before somewhat jokingly, but frankly, it's so convoluted. Like, really, their best option is to get a time machine. You know, can you can you, can you give me Ron English from 2003? Can you give me Greg Madison from 2011 or 12? Can you, can you give me that? You know, can you get me what good Don Brown from 2016? Because, uh, frankly, it's just been a, a revolving disappointment to where I don't know who you could get. But that's the real question. Who could you get? Not, you know, what can they get to bring in, but, like, who is going to be able to help bridge the gap or help them bridge that gap, uh, make it as narrow as, as it possibly can? Because, frankly, uh, I don't see one that really stands out that made me think, oh, yeah, that's what we need. So that one is quite hard to tell, the pinpoint one specifically. You know, maybe it could be someone from the Ravens. You know, he could, you know, Don Mar- uh, I think the guy you were referring to, Frank, was Don, either Don Martindale or Mike McDonald. It was Mike McDonald, of- thank you. Yeah, so who knows? Maybe right, Jimbo could call in to his little, to his little brother and say, hey, I need a favor. So you might be on something with that, Frank. Yeah, sounds like you both just answered question number one altogether. So we'll move on to question number two. How long will the Michigan State Spartans men's basketball team stay unranked? And there will come a time when Tom Mizzo will retire. Ed, we'll start with you again. It will, but I I don't think it's going to be this year. I I don't see Izzo uh, as stubborn as he is, as tough as he is. I don't see him going out like this in this fashion in this year and setting. I I just don't see it. Knowing Izzo, as, as, as I think I know him, he will want to do it in a much better uh, fashion, to say the least. But in regards to MSU for this season, yes, that absolutely can turn around and be ranked again. It comes to ma- comes down to executing down the stretch, uh, not getting the your blow your, your doors blown off, even if you do lose, and frankly, beating the teams that you should beat and surprising one or two people. And you know, I'll say it: they got a grand old opportunity next month on the sixth when they face Michigan. So that will be your litmus test as to how this team can and will look for the rest of this year. February 6th, mark that down. Yeah, all eyes will be on them come that date. Frank, your answer to question two. I would say, yes, they can be ranked again, but it's going to take a lot more effort and a lot more execution from the players in order to do so. No more blowing big leads that you had at the first half, losing games late like you did against Purdue, and also having the right personnel on the floor. Looking at you, Tom Izzo, having the right guys on the floor for appropriate matchups. You need to do that, too, and also beat the teams that you should beat and also get a win against maybe Michigan on February 6th. Who knows if you can do that or not. Or maybe even beat Iowa when that game is rescheduled or get a win against Illinois, too. So beat one of those big three dogs in the conference and maybe you'll get back in to being ranked. And I don't and I don't think Tom is going to retire after this year. I think when he does will probably be after his son Steven graduates and then he'll decide to, you know what, I've had enough. Time for me sense. to sit back and relax in my rocking chair. So that seems more likely, especially Good since point. he's got a very loaded class coming in next year too. Yeah, exactly. Oh, by the way, no, no mentioning Michigan has a, you know, sound like the counterpoint, but Michigan has, as we speak, the number one ranked recruiting class coming in next year. And when you consider the fact what this team has done so far and the fact that they may lose one or two, if not three players this season, knowing that they got this class coming up, ooh, we tell you. <laughs> well, Ed, I, will say, I, will, 
Well, Ed, I'll say this, too. I've maintained that Michigan and Michigan State can very well be the Duke, North Carolina, north of the Mason-Dixon line. And I would say, with the recruits that both teams have coming in, we may, we may very well be seeing the Tobacco Road rivalry in the great state of Michigan. Oh, that's nice. Something of that about, caliber. That's nice. Oh, it took about 45 years since from, like, when Magic Johnson played to, to about now. Wow, yeah. long duration. But hey, all right. I'm all for it. Question number three. Will the Lions possibly possibly hire Kevin Colbert, Ed mentioned that name, as their next general manager. Ed, we'll start with you. Well, depending on who you want to believe, whether it be Stoney or or the other reporter, this and that, that one's a crapshoot. Um, it could be him. It could be Brad Holmes. Uh, it could be anyone, frankly, when you think about it. Hell, I, I just threw out the, the, the Chris Spielman as a theory. Uh, who's to say they could uh, surprise everyone and, and pull a Dick Cheney and say, oh, yeah, we found a new general manager. It's going to be Chris Spielman. <laughs> Matt Millen all over again. Oh, my goodness. I don't know how the fan base is going to react to that because it will give them PTSD, Stockholm flashbacks. So I'm thinking they, they're not going to pull the trigger on that one now, but just keep that in their back pocket for at least a few years down the road. I could see that as a scenario. Not a plan A or plan B, but as a possible, like, hey, let's give this a shot type of deal. So as for who they may hire this year, it, it, it's really uh, out in the open. But I had to pick one, probably Brad Holmes, because they're bringing him in for the second interview. And uh, depending on how far the Rams go in the in this play, in these playoffs, that could be a telltale sign of where things will stand between him and the team. Yeah, you just twisted question number three. Frank, Brad Holmes or Kevin Colbert? I think Brad Holmes is the more realistic hire, unless, of course, the Steelers say Kevin Colbert. Thanks for all you've done, but after our team got absolutely destroyed by the Cleveland Browns on Sunday, we want to go in a different direction. That could happen, but I think Holmes is more realistic given that he's being brought in for a second interview, and truly, I don't think the Rams are going to go much further in the playoffs because they do have to go to Lambeau Field to play the Packers. So I think Holmes is a more realistic option, and as I said, I'm happy with either Brad Holmes or Ed Dodds as the new GM because Mm. of what they've done as directors of player personnel and college scouting. They've identified guys that have been in taken in mid rounds so they've got an eye for talent and what do the lions need to do get better at drafting guys in the middle to late rounds because what has happened in pretty much every gm post matt millen those mid and late round picks have all gone kaput and are not even in football anymore right question number four Will Evgeny Sveshnikov clear waivers and stay in the Red Wings organization? Ed, we'll start with you. Well, to anybody that missed what happened earlier in the episode, I was able to update the Helen St. Helen St. James story in the free press saying that he had cleared waivers, unclaimed, I should say, and as of now, he's still with the team. I don't think they're going to outright cut him because, again, he still has a year left on his deal, so I think he's going to stay with the team. At the very least, I think he'll get sent back down to Grand Rapids, and if he stays healthy and has a good enough showing, he may be given a chance to try out possibly if not at the end of the year but or at least kept on as a uh, another one year type of deal so he get his chance in the big leagues but uh, or, or on the ice with the, with the with the red wings but as of now i don't see him being let go anytime soon right frank ed's got a point right there he absolutely does and i agree with him i think he's going to be given a chance to prove that he's still got it and he can still play at a high level this year and if not then they'll probably say we're going to move on in a different direction Although, and take this for what it's worth, guys, I did kind of read that there may or may not have been talks with the Carolina Hurricanes about sending Svechnikov to the Canes so he could play with his brother, Andre, Mm. which those two, I mean, but then again, I was kind of hoping that he would at least be on the roster so he could play against his brother. So just for a juicy storyline or two, but you know, we'll see what, we'll see what happens. I do sincerely hope that he can get it together and get back to playing at a high level, whether it ends up being here or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. There is a matter of in itself. Yeah. Make sure he stays healthy as well. And finally, question number five, how much longer will Michael Fulmer last as a tiger? Ed, we'll start with you. I am, frankly, I'm usually the optimist, but frankly, I'm just very weary and dreary about Michael Fulmer's future because the words Tommy John, not so uh, pleasant to hear in any capacity, especially in baseball. And there's not really too much of a proven track record of getting your career back at a stable track after this. It's usually the beginning of the end in some sense, instances. Uh, for Michael Fulmer's sake, I'm not expecting him to return to his form where he 
won Rookie of the Year, but I hope he gets better to the point where he, you know, depending on how lo- however long he plays, whether it be two, three, four, even five years from now, it has a much better going than what these past five have been for him. So my my get my best bet at least two to three years at the very least for his sake. Two to three years longer. All right, Frank. I can only say probably at least through this trade deadline because I want to see how he performs first. I mean, if he's a, if he's pitching at a high level, I know I kind of hope that he could get back to where he was in his rookie year, but again, recovering from Tommy John, that's probably more wishful thinking than anything. But if he can at least be a solid starter in the majors, the point where maybe a contending team has him as their third or maybe even fourth starting pitcher in the rotation, then yeah, he's pro- I would say at least through the trade deadline, and we'll see if they decide to move on from him or not, if they want to at least acquire assets for him or if they decide you know what we're gonna extend him for a couple more years but that that's all that remains to be seen so i'm gonna say at least to the trade deadline or a little before and we'll go from there all right bonus question whenever will blake griffin retire a little pissed in here for you ed just take a wild guess if you need to even though Blake has a tendency to get hurt, the way he's reinvented his game alone leads me to believe he can be in the league at least another five years, at the very least. Oh, okay. Because I've seen the way, I've seen how slow Blake Griffin has moved as of late. You know, he was had a very slow jump at one point against Tatum when the uh, Boston Celtics sunk the Detroit Pistons in the M102-100 to in one game. That was on a Sunday. Blake Griffin uh, might no longer have the speed anymore, the moving speed on the court. Frank? No, but he but he can still okay. use his game in other capacities as well. So that's why that led me right. to point out the way he of his game, that five years is a possibility. Yeah, he can still shoot threes. He can nail them. Frank? Definitely. I'll agree with Ed on this one. I'll say probably five years. Granted, he's not as quick as he used to be. But again, like Ed pointed out, he's reinvented his game. He's changed his game. He's evolved somewhat. And I think that's going to allow a little bit more longevity, whether that's five years or maybe even a little longer. I don't think all those five years are going to be with the Pistons, though, because I think eventually he's going to be want to be on a winning team and get a championship ring. But I think he'll be in the NBA at least for another five years, unless he suffers another catastrophic injury. And then he's probably done. Yeah, good point. So uh, that's five questions, and that's the bonus questions, and we have covered everything for this episode. But before we go, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports app called Big It, which influences more and more people who love sports. Enter the referral code STABLES when you sign up. Capital S at the beginning, lowercase b in the middle. Available on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Download the Big It app and sign up with a referral code STABLES for Stables Media. Gentlemen, excellent job as always. That concludes another fine episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. We'll be back next week for Ed Smith, Frank Bajner, and on behalf of Darren Weiss, this is Taylor Phillips signing off. Follow me on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at EdSmith313. And follow Frank Bajner on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Frank underscore Bajner. B-A-J-C-N-E-R. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. And remember, the truth is out there. TTFN, Tots off for now. Power of the people. Hit them with a hind. We rest our case. Stay safe and go blue. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there.